Please stand if you're able for the reading of God's word. The verses today are in Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the winepress and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, He sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent, to, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you, Marvin. Good morning. Good morning to each and every one of you. Um, I do want to say that the music team did a terrific job today at, with Lavinia leading. Can we give them a hand? And I, I've told this before, but before I started preaching, I, I, would, I started to act, when I was called to become a pastor, before I actually started preaching, I used to say to God, but God, how am I going to do this? because I'm afraid to speak in front of groups of people. Um, It was sort of like going to the dentist or something for me. It was really scary to me, and I was very, very nervous. And I used to stick my hand in my pocket over and over again, sitting here sticking my hand in my my jacket pocket literally 50 times during a sermon. It's It's on film, the first sermon in front of 700 people. I was so absolutely nerve wracked that I, I can't even tell you. So, you know, that, that's a factor, okay? Look, let's get going. Who does the church belong to? Okay, I thought you said me, okay. Who does the church belong to? Right answer, right answer, Jesus. Who does the church belong to? Who does the kingdom belong to? Who does Israel and the vineyard belong to? It belongs to God. It belongs to God. We belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Will you pray with me? Uh, Lord, Lord, we ask that you lift us up to you today. We, we certainly, none of us are able to lift ourselves up by, by any forethought, by any capability, by any craft, by any intelligence, by, by any works or deeds. Uh, none of us are worthy in ourselves. Uh, none of us can get there except by you and grace in Christ. Not one of us. And so, Lord, we ask you for uh, your help today. Uh, while the parable today is well-studied and beautiful, there's also a very lot going on here. And it's such an important week in the Lord Jesus Christ's life as he marches towards the cross, and ultimately the resurrection in which our life is found. So Lord, please help us to learn today. Help me to learn. Help each person here to learn. Help each and every one of us to be patient, thoughtful, kind, considerate by your Holy Spirit. Help us to be these things, and not for any one of us to think that we know everything or everything about this scripture today. We thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for teaching us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, our sermon title today is, It is the King's Kingdom. 
It is the king's kingdom, Mark 12, 1 through 12. And point one is Israel and the king. Israel and the king, that's verse one. Point two is false ownership. False ownership, that's verses two through eight. And point three is the kingdom restored. The kingdom restored, that's verses nine through 12. By God's mercy, let's see the true picture today. Israel and the king. Israel and the king. Please read verse 1 of Mark 12 with me. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower. A tower. They could watch and protect the vineyard from there and built a tower and leased it to tenants, and went into another country. So just for a minute with me, let's take stock of where we've been. How did we get here? Why is the Lord Jesus Christ telling this parable? Why now is the Lord Jesus Christ telling this parable? How did we get here? First of all, Jesus came into Jerusalem and was hailed as Messiah, Savior, and King, right? That's the type of sermon that normally would happen next week, right? That Sunday, right? First, Jesus came into Jerusalem and was hailed as Messiah, Savior, and King. Next, the Lord Jesus Christ cursed or brought down the fig tree, which stands for ancient Israel. From there, Jesus cleansed the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and stopped commerce in the temple. Lastly, when it came to questions concerning his authority, this was lastly, week lastly, when it came to questions concerning his authority, Jesus corrected the chief priests, scribes, and elders. They were attacking Jesus. Now, Jesus pronounces a judgment in parable form against the chief priests, scribes, and elders. That's how we got to this parable. That's the run-up to this parable. That's the sequence of events that leads to Jesus pronouncing a judgment against the religious leaders in parable form. This, all, this is all one continuous stream, one constri- continuous stream from theory to reality. That's why it actually is important at times, I usually do it, but it's important at times for all preachers to preach through books of the Bible at times. This is all one continuous stream, one continuous stream from theory to reality. While Jesus told his, his disciples about the fig tree, ancient Israel before, now he's actually pronouncing it directly against the religious leaders in terms of their stewardship over the vineyard, which is also ancient Israel, but a bigger metaphor than the fig tree. So the fig tree stands for ancient Israel, but the vineyard is even a bigger, more well-known metaphor, if you want to call it a metaphor, for ancient Israel, okay? Or for, or for today, for the church, right? There's actually a denomination and churches out there called Vineyard, right? I don't, I don't, I, you know, I don't have anything against the name, but I'm just alerting you to the fact that it also now stands for the church. So, as he makes this pronouncement, Jesus, against the religious leaders, And as this whole sequence of events has unfolded from the the cursing of the fig tree to now this, this parable, this is like watching a wrestling match where the moves are first practiced, right? That was the fig tree. Where the moves are first practiced and transcribed, then put into place against the enemy, and he is pinned in the actual match, which is coming towards us fast, in the cross and the resurrection. Jesus is pinning the chief priests, scribes, and elders, 
the religious leaders of ancient Israel, he's breaking their will and their bodies. He's casting them out of the body, which is Israel, which is the church, which is the kingdom. Why? Because he is king and they are rebellious. Because he is king and they are rebellious. A rebellious heart is a most serious problem and sin. You know, it's real tempting in America today to think it's okay as a Christian to have a rebellious heart because there's a very strong stream of rebellion in the everyday populace in America today. But a rebellious heart is a very serious problem and sin. Adam and Eve were rebellious against God and then came the fall. It wasn't just pride. They were actually rebellious against God, and then came the fall. Now then, in verse 1, we see the power and authority of the king, the power and authority of the owner, the power and authority of God the Father. Please read it again with me. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press, the vineyard, ancient Israel, the kingdom, the church, and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When I read this verse, it sends shivers down my spine because I know God's love for us. When I, see, when I read this verse, it sends shivers down my spine because I know God's love for us, his people. He wants to care for us, you see? He's caring for his people. He's caring for his children. He's caring for the vineyard. He wants to care for us. He wants to protect us. Right? He put up a fence. He dug a pit. He gave means of productivity, wine press. He built a tower for protection and safety. He wants to protect us, and he wants to grow us. You can see all of that here. The vineyard, Israel, God's people, the church has been set up perfectly that we are cared for, protected, growing, and that we can produce. That we can produce. That we can produce with godly leadership, with godly stewardship, with godly faithfulness, we can produce. To him who much is given, much is also expected. Recognizing that Jesus is king, we can produce. Now then, for the sake of 100% clarity, for the sake of perfect 2020 vision, I don't want anybody to walk out of here not knowing this. Let me say that the vineyard is Israel. Let me say that the vineyard is or was ancient Israel. Please turn to Isaiah 5 in your Bible. And we're going to read verses 1 through 8 to see this just because I don't want there to be any confusion about what the meaning of the parable and who Jesus is referring to here. Not Luke 1 to 5, Isaiah. Do we have it? All right, let me find it. Well, I guess you need to open your Bible, please. Isaiah 5, 1 to 8. All right, please go with me now. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. Oh, it's up now. Great, thank you very much. Good job. I like that. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it. You see, this is what Christ is talking about. And hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes. But it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there for, for me to do for my vineyard that I have not done it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its head, its hedge, and it shall be devoured. 
I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled. I will make it a waste, it shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds, and they rain not upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. Now, go one more, a little bit further, even though you see a break there in your Bible. Woe to those who join house to house, who add field to field, until there's no more room. The vineyard is or was ancient Israel, and God gave them clear direction and instructions, and God took care of them, and God had clear expectations. How many of you like to um, fulfill the expectations of, of people that you care for in your life? Can I get a hand? Now, husbands, you know, this is something you got to do, right? <laughs> got to do it, right? But your mom or your dad might have expectations, right? And you fulfill your mom and dad's expectations, right? That's, that's something we grow up doing. That's so crucial to developing as a human being, fulfilling expectations. But just imagine, now we're not talking about the expectations of man or even a close family member, although, you know, dad and mom are a great, you know, represent, representative authority and, you know, show, show us to God the Father. But now we're actually talking about God the Father's expectations for his people, that they will produce real grapes, not wild grapes. God cared for, protected, and grew them. He gave them everything they needed, yet the instructions and directions were not followed and the expectations were not fulfilled. Good grapes did not come forth. And so God will take away his hedge of protection. Now, this actually happened. Jerusalem fell in 70 AD. So the things that Jesus refers to and the things that Isaiah referred to happened. They actually historically happened. Not that long after Christ was there. And so God will take away his hedge of protection. This is the idea that Jesus is referring to or towards the chief priests, scribes, and religious leaders of ancient Israel. They have been unfaithful to God and to true Israel, and now they're going to feel it. And now they're going to feel it in their bones. Now, if you think um, I'm preaching this hard, there are commentators out there that re refer to this passage as something like Jesus's vengeance or something like that. I don't like titles like that. I think that might be going a bit too far. But let me keep going. We must remember that Jesus is the king, Jesus is the king, and Israel is his kingdom, and we are his kingdom. And just remember, the king is more important than the kingdom. Think about that carefully. The king is more important than the kingdom. In other words, the king comes first. And the king is more important than ancient Israel. Clearly, we see that come to pass. For the kingdom and Israel draw their life from the king, not the other way around. Do you understand? We draw our life from Christ, not the other way around. He doesn't draw his life from us. Even, even all of the millions and millions of Christians, they all draw their life from Christ he doesn't draw his life from them. He is God the Son. He is King. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. This is hard for us to wrap our mind around because this is not a democratic ideal or idea. Jesus is not a president. He doesn't need our consent. He doesn't need our vote. Jesus is the King. And in our passage the new Israel, his kingdom is coming. 
So that was point one, Israel and the king, Israel and the king. Now on to point two, false ownership, false ownership. Now we're going to read the bulk of this passage. We're going to read two through eight. When the season came, he, the king, God, sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard, the tenants, the religious leaders of the day. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant. So now we're talking about prophets, preachers, these kinds of things. Again, he sent to them another servant, and they struck him, Isaiah, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and they, him they beat. That's Isaiah. And so with so many others, some they beat and some they killed, the prophets. He had still one other, a beloved son. That's Christ, God the Son, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants, those religious leaders said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance, the vineyard will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. You can also think of this, I call this false ownership. That's my, my title to the point. You can also think of this as rebellion. You can also think of this as covetousness. You can also think of this as war and violence with an aim to keep the land or the kingdom or the people of Israel or the church falsely to own them. I call this false ownership. It is the same impulse for subversion, and rule that drove Satan to trick man, to trick Adam out of his stewardship over creation. False ownership. Now, I'm not going to sit here and explain every detail of this passage to you as a commentator would or in a book because it's very clear. And I even just substituted the words for you so you could see it. They beat up and killed the prophets. They beat up the preachers of God's word. They beat up God's servants and treated them shamefully. Now they're poised to kill the son of God himself because they want the inheritance. They want to take ownership of Israel. They want to take ownership of the church and the kingdom, all of which belong to God. God is the owner. But they have false ownership. They have covetousness. They're trying to steal the title to the house. Now, uh, how many of you feel like in your life you've ever experienced covetousness? That's it? Okay. Well, we've either got some shy people or no disrespect, we've got some people who are fooling themselves because almost everybody has at some time felt covetousness towards something. I mean, wasn't there that neighbor's boat that you just really wanted to have? You know, or, what, or, 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 or ladies, when they there that pair of shoes that your friend had that you saw them maybe when you were 20s or 30s and you went, oh man, I gotta have those. I mean, that's low grade stuff. It goes a lot deeper into the heart than that, right? Covetousness, and no, I'm not picking on anybody. Covetousness is a deadly sin. It gives us this desire to, to, to own things and people that belong to God, right? The great apostle Paul, even the great apostle Paul said, I would not have known sin except for covetousness. Imagine the size of that statement. In a sense, the great apostle Paul is saying, I didn't really struggle with any kind of a sin except covetousness. I've seen this covetousness so many times in so many churches, in so many denominations. They try to steal the property. They try to steal the land, which was such an important concept to Israel. God gave them the land, but they try to steal everything. They even try to steal men's souls by taking them off of the word of God and placing them on gossip, 
intrigue, power, or empty symbols. Churches and denominations, high priests, scribes, and officers who are based on gossip and base their ministry on gossip should be ashamed of themselves. There is really nothing in this world for us. See if you can agree with the statement I'm about to make. There is really nothing important. Really, there is nothing in this world for us but the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word, His mercy, His grace, the love of the Father, and the fruit and the grace of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's really what there is for you in life. There really isn't anything else permanent or meaningful. The rest of this stuff outside of God is transient. It's passing away. You can be covetous of a house, or you can be covetous of a car, or you can be covetous of a boat, or you can be covetous of a person. But all of those things are going to pass away. It's a false idolatry. You know, back in the day, these guys are worried about the temple. They're worried about the temple. Jesus is overturning the money stations in the temple. They're worried about the temple. The temple's going to pass away. The temple was destroyed in AD 70. Because they did not receive the Lord Jesus Christ, their king. Whether it be properties or buildings, land or ethnic identity, these things fade into the blue sky like clouds without a master. I must tell you with all of my heart, love God and love one another. Love God and love one another. My failures are great. My shortcomings are great. But God lifts me up like a weak man riding in the winds of the sky and shows to me these things. Ancient Israel was covetous of the property, covetous of the land, covetous of the people and the church and the kingdom. They didn't want to share it. The chief priests, scribes, and elders determined to kill God the Son. Jesus knows this fate awaits him. He will pray in Gethsemane, Father, if this cup can pass from me, let it. But thy will be done, not my own. The Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect one, cared for everyone, even the chief priests, scribes, and elders, down to the very last. So this is one thing. This is why I disagree a little bit, a little bit, with some of these commentators that talk about this passage from Jesus strictly in terms of vengeance and wrath. The Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect one, cared for everyone, even the chief priests, scribes, and elders, down to the very last. He gave them this parable. He gave it to them as a warning. He made them to understand it. Do you understand normally in parables, they're, not, they're only understandable by those in the kingdom, but he made them to understand it. He made it transparent to them. He made the whole situation transparent to them. Can you imagine? I mean, you know, God knows what's going to happen and God has his perfect plan, but just purely for the sake of, of uh, imagining what it can be when we really repent. Can you imagine what it would be like if these leaders all just got down on their knees and repented from their covetousness and repented from their ownership and turned and received the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, as King? You know what? That's what we all have to do. That's what we all have to do. That's what each and every one of us has to do. That's what each and every one of us does when we truly become a Christian. We repent and turn from our sin, from our selfishness, from our desire to be in control ourselves, from our desire to be king of our own lives. We repent and we accept Jesus Christ as Lord, Savior, and king. 
So Jesus is still bringing them to a point. He allows them to understand this parable that they could repent. Instead, they're furious. Instead, they're even more resolved. The Lord Jesus Christ here teaches us clearly. God owns the vineyard. God owns the land. God owns the kingdom. God owns the church. It is his. The man who feels like he owns the church is a fool. The man who submits to God serves well. The vine dressers may say, Come, let us kill the heir, and the inheritance will be ours. Let us kill the son and cast him from the vineyard. They may say it. They may even do it. But that does not make it so. Christ rose. Christ rose. And he rules on the right hand of the Father in power. Okay, that was point two. Point three now, my friends. Point three. The kingdom restored. The kingdom restored. Can you, can you read verses 9 through 12 with me? What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And, and now this, this is the reaction of heart that the religious leaders had. And they, this is what prophetic speech the word does. It either brings a person to repentance or hardens them either further. When you really hear the word preached or you really hear the word, it always does one of those two things. It always, it, you either repent and turn towards the Lord or your heart gets harder in certain ways, right? When you hear prophetic speech. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people. For they perceived that he had told the parable against him. I'm sorry, against them. So they left him and went away. Point three now, the kingdom restored. Again, this looks like wrath and pain and judgment. And that's how most expositors frame it. But this is mainly justice and this is mainly righteousness. The kingdom, the church, and Israel all belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, and God restores them. You can't have Israel, the church, or the kingdom without Jesus. Who agrees with that statement? You can't have Israel, the kingdom, or the church without Jesus. Now, don't think there's not people who try to do it. Um, years ago, um, at my last place, my last church, we used to take a group of ladies in their 80s and 90s every quarter to the Baptist Student Union at the university down there. I won't name which one. You probably know. But we take them down there and they cook a meal for the students. Right? And there was a guy there who was a minister there. He was a young guy. He was about 25, 28. Well, they had this huge property. It was like a $3 million property. And there were like eight people there. And every, every year we'd go down there and we'd make this meal. I'd help too. I'd, tr I'd get next to the old ladies and I'd, you know, I'd, I'd help them prepare and cook and serve. You know? And we'd, we'd say eight. I'm sorry. Did I say old ladies? Wrong, wrong word. Older ladies. How's that? Older ladies. Okay? So, so we'd be out there, and we, you know, I mean, if I can't get away with it with 90-year-olds, I mean, I'm not going to get away with it at all, right? So, so, so we'd be out there, and one year, one of the older ladies asked me and said, you know, when we used to come here 40 years ago, there were 120 people here, and now there's less than 10. Why? Well, the first thing I said, well, I'm sorry, ladies, but that's the way that Christianity is going on campuses and universities in the United States. And that's actually the way that Christianity go, is going in America as a whole. And that's why the overall numbers at churches across the board, if you take them just as a whole, go down year over year over year, you know? Yeah, there's some exceptions, but overall, that's the case, right? And so, and so 
I said, that's the first thing. I said, but I don't know. I'll try to figure out about the second. So I went to this young minister, and I talked to him. I said, hey, you know, I come out here, and I never hear you preach God's word. I never hear you say anything about Jesus, even when he prays. And he said, oh, no, I don't do that. I said, what do you mean? He said, I don't mention Jesus ever. I said, why not? He says, because it offends people. This is an ordained minister, a Baptist. Because it offends people to talk about Jesus. I said, well, what do you, I said, well, excuse me, because you know something I don't. If you don't talk about Jesus, what do you do? Oh, well, I have a night where there's music, and I have a night where there's art, and I have a night where people read poetry. I said, brother, you don't have a student ministry here. You've got a social club. There is no church without Jesus Christ. There is no Israel without Jesus Christ. There is no kingdom without Jesus Christ. He is the Lord. He's Lord of the church, Lord of the kingdom, and Lord of Israel. The king is so important that the kingdom actually goes with him. You see, that's what we see in ancient history. I see this so much in America in the 21st century. People think that the church is a building. Wrong. Or a magnificent cathedral. No. A hundred times no. The church is the people of God looking to Jesus Christ as Lord. The kingdom is the people of God. I just said the church is the people of God looking to Jesus Christ as Lord. The kingdom is the people of God looking to Jesus Christ as Lord. The kingdom is where Jesus Christ is Lord. In here. Israel, the people of God, is, is the people of God only when they're looking to Jesus Christ as Lord. As the masterful Winston Churchill said about the Nazis, you cannot negotiate when your mouth is in the head of a tiger. We cannot advance the kingdom when we're covetousness, when we're covetous. We cannot advance the kingdom when our first concern is property or money. We cannot advance the kingdom when we think it belongs to us. God takes this all away from us. It all belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. It belongs to him today, tomorrow, and forever. We must not try to kill the prophets. We must not try to hurt the ministers of God's word or any minister of the gospel of Christ. Please turn with me to Romans 10, verse 14. How, will the, how then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? Unless they are sent. Sometimes it's surprising the ones that God sends to people. Unless they are sent. As it is written... How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of Israel. Now, here's where it connects to, to our verses today even more. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. The road is hard and the way is long, but it leads to Christ. 
Now, let's think of our verses in Mark 12, 9, in Mark 12, 9 to 12, literally. Christ made it apparent that God would decimate the temple as well as the sacrificial system and the chief priests, scribes, and elders. All of this happened in 70 AD when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. Essentially, Jesus was giving it to others, others who were under his headship. Please read verses 10 and 11 of Mark with me one more time. Have you not read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This shows us that Jesus Christ, Messiah, is not accepted, but still ends up as the cornerstone. This is what has happened in the church. This is what has happened even in the new Israel. The Lord Jesus Christ is head of the kingdom. Of course, this stuff upset the religious leaders. They were covetous, but that's verse 12. But this is not the main thing. The main thing is that the kingdom, the church, the true Israel, the vineyard, has been restored to Jesus Christ our Lord, the King. He is truly King. He died for our sins and rose. He brought us life. So, if you were, uh, if you were taking and breaking down everything that, that we learned today from the Word and applying it to your life, and you really melted it down far enough, you would take away one thing to apply over and over again in your life, day to day, and that is Jesus is Lord. Wake up remembering that Jesus is Lord. Go to sleep remembering that Jesus is Lord. Look at your house and say, Jesus is Lord. Don't look at your house and say, I need new gutters. You might need new gutters, and maybe you can get good gutters, and that might be good stewardship. But look at your house and remember that Jesus is Lord. Look at the church and remember that Jesus is Lord. That this all, all of this, whatever this is, this all belongs to Jesus. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to him. Let's pray. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you rose. Thank you, Lord, that you went to the cross. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you, that you did these things, that you came to us. We see in the parable that the man sent his beloved son to the vineyard. God the Father sent his beloved son to walk among us to care for us? Will we fully and truly accept him in our life day to day? Lord, we all have a ways to go. Help us to be more fully accepting in our hearts of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we do thank you for giving us a new heart, a new birth by the Holy Spirit, and we thank you that we can receive Christ in his word. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.